Hello and welcome to the World Wanderers Podcast, your source for travel stories, travel destinations, and travel philosophy. I'm Amanda. I'm Ryan. And we're your hosts. Welcome back to the World Wanderers Podcast. This episode is brought to you by the supporters on Patreon. A big shout out to all of our supporters on Patreon. If you want to see the continued growth, expansion, and world domination of the World Wanderers podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash the world wanders. And on this week's episode of the podcast, we're really excited to bring you an interview with Peter Nager, who is a friend that we've connected with and somebody who really inspires us. He's an author. He's biked across America, not only once, but twice. And he's here to tell us his story. And one of the main focuses for talking to him and talking about his story is actually talking about his decision to quit biking across the U.S. And lots of times that can come as a really negative thing. But as travelers, I think we can all relate to that experience when you feel like you're just kind of done and you want something different and how it can be really difficult to take that step when you've got traveler, backpacker, digital nomad attached to your identity. So we dig into that a little bit into the interview. So uh, definitely stick with us and we hope that you enjoy it. So without further ado, here's Peter. All right. We are very excited to be joined on the podcast today by Peter Niger. Peter is the author of a new book called Wandering Oak uh, about his journey biking across America. Um, But it wasn't actually the first time uh, that he had ridden around the whole country. Um, And Peter is kind of someone we've connected with a little for quite a while. And we've kind of thought like, oh, we should have him on the on the show. Um, So we're we're very glad you're finally here, Peter. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, um, we connected, God, I guess a couple of years ago because of Isaac Morehouse, I think. He, you yeah. had him on the show recently, and that's how I first heard about you guys. And I've been following the podcast for a while now. So I'm really excited to be here. This is going to be fun. Awesome. So the place that I thought would be great to start would be um, 2012. You're working in Washington, D.C. Um, yep. kind, of, kind of, I guess you would be like more on a conventional career path at that point. And then yeah. out of the blue quit <laughs> head across yeah the i i was very much on the traditional career path um i joined the military in 2001 and then after that used the gi bill to get a college degree and immediately just launched into a career in washington dc and on paper everything was great i had a good job i had a good social network i like was in a field that i could advance for years and years and years making that government money if i wanted to but i found myself incredibly unhappy Like I was going through periods of depression. I didn't feel attached to my job. I didn't love anything I was doing. And at one point I said, you know what? I've always wanted to see the country. I'm just going to quit my job, get rid of everything I own and spend a summer bicycling across the country. And I did. I uh, like the last day of work, I literally walked down to the lobby of the hotel that we were at. I put my suit in the trash can as I walked out (laughs) the door, got on my bike and just typed in Google directions to see where I was going to be headed that day. And That's just so cool. kind of pounded it out like 40 to 60 miles at a time across the country. Wow. Did you have any like long distance biking experience before that? I don't think I'd been on a bike since I was a kid bicycling around the neighborhood, really. No, wow. I'd never done more than like five or 10 miles at a time. I did one trial run of 20 miles and like that was it. That was all the only <laughs> training I did beforehand. It's like, I can make it around the city. I can probably get across the country. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's not that big. Um, Yeah. It's, it's pretty big. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I drove from Canada down to Atlanta and then we drove back from Atlanta back to Canada, like Mm. the long way around. And that was like in a car, like my, like a fully functioning Pontiac (laughs) 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 can drive easily 80 miles an hour. And I felt like that was quite a long distance that I covered. (laughs) Oh, no, it was. I mean, everything you do in an hour would take me about a day. That's about the general conversion rate for bicycle to car. So what was it about the idea of biking across the country that attracted you? Um, You know, it actually does go back to my time in the military. I was in uh, the 82nd Airborne Division, and they're called the All-Americans because they were the first unit that had a soldier from every single state in it. This was back in World War II. And so, like, that was kind of a theme that went through my time in the military is I'd talk to these guys who were from all over the country, places I'd never been, never heard of. I'd hear about how special their homes were to them. And I thought, man, I kind of want to visit that at some point. But I always just figured I would just, like, get in a car and visit them. But then as I kind of, like, 
got more adjusted to life in DC, found myself unhappy. And I had some friends in Los Angeles. I was like, screw it. I'm leaving DC. I know that. So why fly when I can bike, when I can have an adventure? Why just hop on a plane with my luggage and then just go right back into the rat race in a new city? So, you know, I took my one last paycheck I had and just head off to see what would happen. And so day one, how far did you make it on that very first day? Almost nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> the first day was actually pretty terrible. I was less than, I don't know, probably five miles outside of D.C. when I like blew a tire on my bike, nice. which normally wouldn't be a big deal. But I actually didn't have any equipment to fix it. I had no idea what I was doing. Like I was completely unprepared. So I ended up spending most of the first day walking my bike to a bike shop to get my tire fixed. So I probably made it like 15 or 20 miles that first day, which is not very far when you have a sun up to sundown, no schedule, nothing else to do in the middle of summer. When you have 14 hours, you should be able to go more than 14 miles. Yeah. At that point, when you're like blew a tire, like 15 miles outside of the city or whatever, did yeah. any part of you feel like maybe this is a bad idea? Maybe I should just turn around and not do this? Oh, it ha that happened all the time. I probably had that thought every day for the first month, especially when I... I guess it was about two weeks in, I got into West Virginia and I'm in the middle of nowhere, rural West Virginia. And like my bike breaks beyond repair. And I'm like, what am I doing? I'm stranded a hundred miles from Pittsburgh. I don't know anybody. My phone has 3% battery. This is a really, really stupid decision. You hear that? Yeah, it was, it was like, I, uh, but I pushed through, I was able to find a guy that could repair my bike in his garage and paid him some cash under the table met some interesting folks along the way, but yeah, no, there were lots of moments where I was like, I don't know why I'm doing this. Who am I trying to prove anything to? I could just go about and have a normal life. Everyone else seems pretty happy with it. Yeah. What do you think continued to like drive you forward then in those moments? Uh, there were a lot of different things. Um, everything from before I left, I overheard someone who was a friend of mine tell me that they didn't or tell someone else that they didn't think I would make it a hundred miles. So like hearing kind of like that negativity, like urged me on in a lot of ways. I also had a ton of, I mean, we live in a beautiful world where I can post on Facebook and say, I'm having a bad day and I'll receive 200 messages of love and support from people from all over the world. And so like stuff like that. So when you have a bad day and you can reach out to strangers and friends alike and they encourage you to go on, it just kept me moving. And then, you know, for every one of those bad days, there were dozens of great days and beautiful moments and stuff that I wouldn't trade anything for. Yeah, so what were some of the highlights of that first trip across the country? Um, two, well, uh, there's lots of highlights. Um, I kind of stumbled upon a pagan festival in Indiana and spent a weekend celebrating with pagans and worshiping Pan and Aphrodite and just seeing how a religion that's completely foreign to the like Judeo-Christian tradition that I grew up in and just like meet people just like spot, like spot, like just randomly be able to run into experiences like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there was, um, a time in New Mexico where I met someone who was part of a Christian motorcycle club and he called one of his pledges so that we could sleep at his pledges church. And so you like stay up all night talking to a motorcycle gang member, you know, Harley's for Christ in New Mexico. And it's just, <laughs> I would have never had that experience if I just got in a car, just got on a plane, put on my headphones and traveled. Yeah. yeah, you just have like so much opportunity for serendipity where it's like, oh, yeah, I, I feel like more and more because we have um, like, you know, you've got Uber and you've got Airbnb and you've got uh, awesome food delivery services mm -hmm. and Google Maps. Like as we get our needs met, you have like less of an opportunity to have uh, interesting experiences that kind of just like force their way into your life and kind of oh, yeah. let you know something new about yourself. Because you can, if you get what you want all the time, you obviously often don't learn about other things that you really like. Oh, I, absolutely. And I mean, I see that just in my current job where I work from home. Like I have to make an honest effort to go out and meet people and do things because it's so easy to just trap myself in my little bubble where I can call Papa John's, order an Uber and do everything electronically and never actually have face-to-face -face experiences or get out into nature and just spend two days hiking along a river because it's beautiful and that's what you want to do that day.
Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, you need to. Someone needs to make like a serendipity app where it just like <laughs> gives you like instructions. And it's like, go to the river immediately, yeah. and it's like yeah. sets something up for you. Oh my gosh, no! It'll <laughs> <laughs> just be a kayak waiting, and it just tells you to go down yeah, river for two hours and see what happens. Kayak, yeah, <laughs> charges your credit card after for the serendipitous <laughs> experience. Um, how long did it take your body to adjust to like being on a bike every day? Uh, probably about five to seven days. Like I was pretty sore that first week, but after that, it's a lot of exercise, but it's a very light repetitive motion. So your body actually like adjusts pretty quick and you also get to eat whatever you want. I lost like 20 pounds and I was eating thousands of calories a day, just all the time, like Taco Bell and fast food and whatever I wanted to eat. Because I mean, if you're just exercising for 12 hours a day, it takes care of itself. Oh yeah. That's like living the dream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So then you, you got to L.A., you kind of settled into a more, uh, I guess, like conventional life there as well, yep. right? Yep. I uh, I found a job in a completely different career, but it was a professional job. And I worked there for about two years before I realized that I was just falling right back into the same habits that I was in in D.C. And I was unhappy. And I'd met my wife at that point and we were living together. And I had said it's like, well, we weren't we were living together, but we weren't engaged at that point. And I'd say, it's like, hey, I really think I'm going to go on a bike ride again. And this time I'd like to see the entire country. Do you want to come with me? And she was like, yeah, let's do it. So she basically went to her work and said, hey, I want to work remotely or I quit. And they're like, well, okay, you can work remotely. And then and then we took off for what ended up being two and a half years. And we only got to 24 of the lower 48 states. But when you got back, part- when you first got to L.A., mm-hmm. if someone had told you, oh, and like two and a bit years, you're going to be out biking across the country again. Would that have been surprising to you? Or did you kind of know at that point that it was something you wanted to do again? I I knew at that point that it was something I wanted to do again. It was just a matter of like financial logistics and trying to find a way to make it actually work. Um, But I knew like I knew pretty quickly after getting that new job that it wasn't for me, that I had a great boss. It could have been a great career. And he was very understanding of me. But I'm just not a person that puts on a suit and comes into an office five days a week, especially if it's a job that doesn't that current, that job, like I would get phone calls at 10 o'clock at night to like do work. And like, it was just always on, 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 which is how the industry is in Los Angeles and DC. Like those are very high strung cities and people expect you to work 68 hour weeks all the time. And that just wasn't a life I wanted. It didn't matter how much they paid me. It wasn't about the money. Yeah. Yeah, I have a lot of respect for that because that's kind of how I feel as well. I feel like there needs to be boundaries when it comes to work and yes. like work-life balance is probably the thing that's the most important to me. I'd rather make like $12,000 a year than $100,000 a year and have some balance in my life. Oh, yeah. And I have friends that make four or five, eight times what I do, but they're working all the time and they're super stressed. And I'm like, no, I would much rather have a very minimalist life or live be- kind of beneath my means and work 20 hours a week. Or am able to take long weekends or go to festivals and things like that whenever I want. Mm-hmm. So was it 2015 when you guys set out again from LA? It would have been 2014. It would have been spring of 2014 is when we took off. Wow. So you you were almost going for two years of, of biking. Yeah. Yeah. We, we left in two. Is that correct? 14, 15. Yeah. We left in 2014 and we made it from Los Angeles up to Montana, spent a winter. And then the next year explored the Midwest a little bit, made it to Texas, spent the winter and then then came up here through 2016 and then stopped. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. What was it like to do the bike trip the second time with your wife? Uh, it was, it was different for a lot of reasons because, um, well, she had, she was working the entire time we were on the road. And then I actually found an online job after that first like year. So I had for a year and a half, I had an online. So we would do like three days and then stop at a place where we could get Starbucks for a couple of days and work. Or we would do, you know, four hours of biking, six hours of work at a coffee shop. Um, so that changed things a lot. And also just traveling with someone like we're actually talking about writing a book, basically like how to adventure with your partner without killing each other. <laughs> because if you're stuck in a six by six tent with someone for two years, essentially where you're not more than 15 feet away from that person. Like you have to have really good communication skills. You have to be able to like handle stress. Well, like there's a lot of like interesting stuff that you won't experience if you have a more traditional life. Yeah. We've definitely felt that in our lives as well. And obviously we're not, 
we're not sleeping in tents or uh, hauling around all our possessions on a bike as often. But yeah, yeah but you're, you're traveling around. I mean, just not having the normal domestic life causes yeah, a lot get, of stress sometimes. You get thrown into so many situations where there's like things that are out of your control that are happening mm-hmm. and you're causing you to freak out. Like you're trying to like get yeah. off a train because you just realized this, your stop just happened and you yeah. didn't know until it's about to move away and you're like yeah. about to snap at each other. But yeah, you kind or of... Or you're like starving and like yeah, our, just our, being hungry. Like both of us being like... hungry is just like such oh, a yeah. recipe for disaster and it's like as soon as we <laughs> eat, it's like, oh, I actually like don't hate you. <laughs> I was yeah. just really hungry. But it's like being hungry in a new place where there's a language barrier and you're hot yeah. and your stuff's on your back and you're like just ready to lose your mind. <laughs> oh no, we had we had plenty of times where we would stop for the night at what we thought was gonna be a campground and the campground had closed two years earlier. And so it's like, oh now it's dark and we haven't eaten in four hours, which is a long time when you're on the bike and we have no idea where we're gonna sleep and the dog keeps barking and we don't know what to do with him now because he's tired and so, so you guys actually had a dog as well with you when you were up. Yeah, that was an accident. Um, <laughs> we fostered him in Los Angeles because we convinced ourselves that we would never be able to travel with a dog. And then after about a month, we bought a trailer to see if he would handle it well. And he did great. So he traveled with us in this trailer that attached to the back of my bike. Wow. Yeah, we had a... Was it kind of like one big... of those baby cart things? Yeah, it, it's like a baby trailer, but he's, I mean, he's 55 pounds. He's a big, he's a medium sized dog. So he's not just like a tiny chihuahua or something, but that's yeah, a lot it was of a, extra weight to be biking with. Yeah. That's actually part of the reason why we didn't complete the lower 48 is because we were moving at about half the speed we expected because, you know, you have a dog, but you also have to carry dog food, which means you have to carry extra water, which we, like it just magnifies very quickly. And then if, if you're on a bike and you know that you're not going to find a city in 30 miles and that's now a day away. You have to get that much extra food, that much extra water, that much extra equipment every time you leave. Wow. So, no, it was – and trying to go up, like, California mountains or across the Rockies with a dog dragging you down is – it's an experience. <laughs> yeah, so when you guys set out, was your goal to do all the lower 48 states? Yeah, and that's that's still what we plan on completing at some point. But we decided after two and a half years, we had just reached a point where we weren't having fun anymore. And we said, you know what? We really liked Wilmington. We knew people there, so we're going to set up here for a couple of years and then finish up the other, the rest of the lower 48 at another time. Yeah, so how many states did you complete so far? Uh, 24, but we got most of the big ones. We got you know the West Coast through the Midwest, and now we just have like north of D.C. to Maine and then cut across the country again back to California. Okay, wow, yeah. The, the whole West slash Central of the country would be, I imagine, the harder ones to do. Oh, yeah. Like California took us, I think, a month and a half. Montana was about a month. North Dakota was three weeks, something like that. Like, those are giant, giant places. Like, yeah, you know, they're just, just so vast. We just even like driving across um, Montana and I was Wyoming. Just say that. You're like, it's like incredible. You're just like, is, is this state going to ever end? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, when, I, when I drove to Atlanta, I drove like down to Bozeman because I've got a really good friend there and I stayed with her for a couple of days. So it's like the stress of crossing the border. I'd like made it, but I'd only driven like <laughs> eight hours. I still had like 30 more hours of my drive to go. And I set out to like go across Montana and it took me like two days to get across Montana and South Dakota. Yeah. And I was in a car. Yeah. Oh no. Are you I'm up in to- Alberta then? Uh, so right now we're actually in Indonesia. We're in Bali. Right oh, now. are you? Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, nice. So, nice. Wouldn't be in a tank top if I was in Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, yeah, my brother, my brother lives in Calgary, and I oh, saw cool. they have like 10-degree weather right now or something. I was like, wow, it's, we're going to the beach tomorrow. It's lovely here. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we spent the summer in Alberta, and then since October, we've been in Asia. Nice. Yeah, so, so we're... Yeah, I grew up just outside of Calgary, though, so... Oh, okay, cool. It's kind of like home, you know, some, Someday we'll get to Asia. We have this dream of like basically cycling every country at some point. And... Wow. Probably not without, not with the dog, but (laughs) (laughs) I can't imagine like trying to, I mean, one, like all those things that you were talking about, like dog food, water, the extra weight, Mm -hmm. but like border crossings in Asia are already a thing. Like how did you do that with the dog would just be such a nightmare. I mean, it was hard enough when we drove up to Canada to visit my brother and we had the dog and we got a lot of hassle. So yeah, I know we're, we've decided that he's going to sit the rest of the traveling out. He, uh, he doesn't enjoy it enough. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure it's not that, that fun for him either to just like sit in the trailer all day. <laughs> yeah. 
It's in the Nobody trailer and bark at cows that go by or whatever else he gets excited by. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to zoom in kind of on the decision to pause yeah. the bike trip. It was You guys had been going for about two years. Um, when did you start to get the feeling that it might be good to settle down for a while? Um, it was probably, let's say, April or May of 2016. We stopped right after 4th of July in 2016. Um, we had been traveling through, like, the deep south. Like, we'd gone up through Georgia and South Carolina, and the road conditions were terrible. It's the least bike-friendly place we'd ever been. We were constantly, like, literally for days, we would have to be checking over our shoulder every couple seconds because we're on a major highway and there's no shoulder. So we're just, like, terrified that we're going to get hit by cars all the time. And it just, we weren't having a good time. We found ourselves looking more and more looking forward to the stops and to the cities we're going to visit instead of the actual adventure. And we just kind of had a conversation outside of D.C. that's like this this isn't what we want anymore. It's time to stop. And it was kind of difficult because you get like attached to this identity. Like we became that couple that's traveling the country by bike. And we almost felt like we were disappointing a bunch of people when we said that we were stopping because we had you know made all these announcements that we were going to see the whole country. And then we didn't. So there was some, I don't know, tension, but I think when we both sat down and like, cause we talked about it and then biked a little bit and talked about it again. And in that second discussion, we're like, yeah, this is the right decision. There was like no doubt after we'd given it a little thought. And it was just, I don't know, there's things we like to do aside from cycling. Like I like to brew beer. We like to garden. We like to, you know, do arts and crafts and I like to do writing. And there's just things we can't do when you're on, when you're traveling constantly. Yeah, there's like the the part of you that you long for when you're settled down, like the adventure mm-hmm. and um, that part of you. But then once you go out and adventure, you start realizing that there's like a part of you that you miss when you yeah. can't when you can't be stable in one place, like you know, brewing beer. Um, I mean, and w- and we also know that once we get moving again, we're going to appreciate it a lot more. We're going to enjoy it a lot more. Like no matter what it is, if you do it day to day to day to day, no matter how much you love it when you start. After a couple of years, probably a lot less, it's just going to become routine. It's going to become a job. It's not going to be something you love anymore. And you kind of need those breaks. I don't know. Variety is very important for like Anna and I. We both just like love having new experiences and trying new things and learning new things. So even as awesome as an adventure is, if it's the same adventure over and over again, we find ourselves bored or find ourselves getting stressed out and ready to stop. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I imagine with biking, um, because it is like, I imagine like chaotic and so much other stuff changing. When did it, how long did it take before it kind of became just like normal? Um, I'd probably say like a month and a half is like, like right when we finished about California and entered Oregon. So probably the first month after a month and a half, it really stopped like being exciting in a way. Like there were lots of cool things where you're like, Oh, we're going to go to crater Lake. Oh, we've always wanted to see the beaches and stuff. But it wasn't like the novelty of cycling was no longer there, which I think it was really good that we stopped it for a winter in Montana and then stopped for a winter in Dallas because that kind of like reset everything for us. So when we left Montana, we were excited again. And then we left Texas, we were excited again. But yeah, I'd say a month and a half before just kind of novelty wore off. And it was just like the day to day. It's like, okay, wake up, go through our routine, get on the road, figure out where we're going to be sleeping that night. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting, like as humans, I feel like we're such creatures of habit that and and we're so adaptable as well. It's like we adapt mm-hmm. so quickly to these situations that are really uncomfortable for us. And then it becomes really routine and we kind of like crave breaking the routine. And it, it's something that we've talked about as well, because like sometimes we have to stop and be like, oh, yeah, like we're in Bali and we can take Wednesday off to go like yeah. hike a waterfall. Like, that's yeah. pretty amazing. A lot of people can't say that they're doing that. But <laughs> yeah. it becomes so normal. Like, when people are like, oh, my gosh, you're in Bali. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm in Bali. Like, I've been here for 40 days now. It's not that yeah. new. <laughs> um, oh, it's, it's, like, still, it's amazing, you know? But it's reminding yourself of that when it's it's your everyday reality. It's like when I lived in D.C. and I didn't go to any museums unless someone was visiting from out of town. Or like when we lived in L.A., like I went to the beach twice unless I had someone visiting from out of town. It's like it's four miles from my house. I should go to the beach once in a while. It sounds like like, Ryan hiking the mountains. Yeah, when we were like in Banff in Canada, it's like visitors come like, okay, let's like suit up. Let's go for a hike. 
<laughs> other than that, I like I hiked probably like the least of anyone there, other than yeah. like, the old people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> children who hiked more than you <laughs> what are some things like now that you're settled down what are some things that you find yourself missing about being on the road um i don't know i miss the daily change of scenery because as stressful as it was to not know what you were going to be doing that day or like where you're going to be sleeping or what roads you're going to be taking there was excitement to it like you'd get to the crest of a hill and look down and be like, oh, I had no idea there was a river here. Or you'd enter a town that has some strange historical marker that you find interesting. Like there were surprises around every turn. And that's really, it, at least I haven't found a good way to replicate that in a more stable environment. Um, I miss the regular exercise too. It's hard to wake up in the morning and go for a run. Like it's so much easier when your entire job is to exercise. I'm sure too, like <laughs> changing your diet back to like, oh, right, my body. I can't just eat Taco Bell every day. <laughs> oh, no, I yeah. actually get fat. <laughs> I, yeah, I like swelled up like 20 pounds when we first stopped and like had to like calm it down a little bit. But, yeah, I remember like watching a friend go through, this is totally different, but like marathon training. So it's like she was marathon training for like nine months and running like every single yeah. day, like long distances and her body just like slimmed down so fast. She was eating so much. And then she didn't change her eating when she stopped marathon training. And she's like, I don't understand why my pants don't fit anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's like, <laughs> like, cause you're not running every day and you're yeah. still eating as much as you, you did when you were marathon training. <laughs> yeah. I had that same experience when I got out of the military too. Cause I just went from exercising all the time to college, which is the opposite of exercising yeah. for me. So. Yeah. <laughs> Diet of like beer and pizza. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Something that I'm curious about, like, do you feel like as a person, you can be, you can find a middle ground between the the need for um, adventure and like the, the, you know, the bike trip part of yourself and the part of you that likes being settled down? Do you find, feel like you can find like some sort of perfect balance of a life? Yeah. Or do you feel like you need to kind of swing back and forth kind of? Uh, I. I think I need to personally need to spring back and forth, but I don't think it needs to be such extremes. Like I kind of like the Tim Ferriss approach to things where you just like, you know, do six months, mini retirements or these shorter, like vacations, like, like we're talking about already. It's like once we like get everything settled and our fine, like our savings back built up and stuff, it's like, Oh, well let's go spend a month in Iceland. Let's go spend six weeks doing biking across some of the States. Like there's lots of cool adventures you can go on that don't require a two year commitment. And so I think that's at least for the next few years, that's kind of what we're going to do. Like maybe every two or three months have like a, an extended adventure that's longer than a weekend, but it isn't like a commitment, a life commitment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's something that's been interesting experience for us because uh, our previous two trips, we had been um, basically just like completely disconnected. We finished college mm -hmm. and we went and traveled for six months. We came back, we worked um for two years kind of had an experience like you probably had in DC where had a job that was like on a career track. And then we just like yeah. quit, you know, sold <laughs> everything, went to South America, spent six months just like doing whatever we wanted. Um, yeah. and now we're trying to find this like mean where we've got jobs online. So we're, you know, earning an income, but there's still like some part of it that's kind of like there was something that was there when it was just complete like freedom, like, you know, yeah. just in South America for six months, that's kind of not there when you have to stay connected and yeah. all this other stuff. And it's, yeah, it's been interesting for us kind of learning how, learning what's missing and how you can't really have like this perfect yeah. travel, I mean, I, life, work balance thing. I think that was kind of the difference between my first like solo bike ride and then the one that Anna and I did is that on my solo bike ride, I had no, like I had no job. I had no connection. If I wanted to go off the grid for a week, my mother would worry, but that would be the extent of it. And then with the other one, it's like, we did have to stop to work. We did have to stop to do all this planning. And it was a very different experience. I don't know. Maybe we humans are just never satisfied, but yeah, I it's, think fun. it's fun to pursue it though. I don't know. I'm having a good time trying to be satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good point. Like even like as much as you can be aware that like, okay, I'm just going to readjust and I'm going to go through waves of up and downs. And as much as I know that like my down waves aren't like compared to previous points in my life, they're like slightly ridiculous, but it's just yeah. like, I'm always going to adjust and I'm always going to be like upset because of, oh, this thing's not going perfectly or this yeah. thing's not going perfectly. 
Yeah, it's kind uh, of there interesting is... to think about that. <laughs> Maybe that's like the whole like meaning of life. It's just trying to find <laughs> satisfaction. <laughs> yeah. Kind of, I don't know. I think there's power in accept and knowing that you're never going to be completely satisfied. That you are always going to have like a grass is always greener perceptive perception of some things. Yeah, and I think that's okay. I don't know. I think that's kind of what helped our species continue to push on, to continue to explore new frontiers, to you know, make scientific discoveries, create great works of art is this like a lack of satisfaction that we're always pursuing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's a really good point. It's like maybe the internet would have never been discovered if somebody didn't feel like unsatisfied with how yeah. like slow mail is or something like yeah. that. I mean, yeah, every major invention was someone that saw an opportunity to make things a little bit better. They just weren't satisfied with the way life was and they had a curiosity about how to correct it. So, For people, I think a lot of people can relate to the experience of they've set out on some trip. Maybe they quit their job and were like, I'm going to go, you know, trek through India for four months. Um, (laughs) That's just a random one. Do people trek through India? I don't know. Maybe they did something else. But they get to a point where they're like, you know, it becomes normal. And they're like, hmm, I kind of find themselves missing home. And there's like it's a tough situation to balance because part of you knows like oh I should keep pushing on because you know I shouldn't just like give up the moment it gets uncomfortable but yeah. obviously there comes to a point where maybe you know stopping what you're changing direction is is the right thing to do like from going through your experience I remember you posted on Facebook a while ago something about the best decision you've made um, in the last couple of years was deciding to stop the bike ride. How do you how did you know that this was a good decision to make? This is the right motivation. This isn't me backing off because I'm uncomfortable. This is me doing the right thing. Well, I think that's exactly like at some point I was able to realize that it wasn't just like discomfort, that it was actually becoming unhappiness. Like when you're no longer when you're like looking ahead at the long term and. I didn't see any bright horizon. I wasn't saying, man, this sucks right now, but as soon as we get to Philadelphia, it's going to be fantastic again and it's going to be great. It's like, no, I found myself like kind of dreading every step I had ahead. And I can logically look at it and go, I shouldn't dread this. This is going to be awesome. I have friends in Philly and Pittsburgh and New York and I've never been to Maine. And the fact that I couldn't muster up the ability to look forward to that made me feel like that there actually was something, that stopping was something that we really needed to consider. Because it wasn't just, this sucks right now because it's hot. It's, this bike ride is not making me happy anymore. Yeah, and even as much as you can tell yourself, oh, I should be happy about this. If you stop and pause and are honest, you're like, oh, I'm just not. And that kind of, and that, (laughs) that'll even like make things worse if you're trying to guilt yourself into being happy about something. But we stayed in D.C. for 10 days. And it, so we took a fairly substantial break for us. And at the end of that break, we still were 100% wanting to stop. So it's like that was kind of like the sign. We put a little pause on it to give our like bodies a break, to just like kind of detox from the adventure. And we still didn't want to continue at that point. And now we're already talking about how excited we are to pick it up again in like summers ahead. But But it was absolutely the right decision for us. I, don't know, I think I think a lot of people are afraid to change course. I know I was like I probably should have quit my job in D.C. a year earlier than I did. Yeah. But like it's hard to change course even when you're miserable. Yeah. Definitely. That's totally something we can relate to. Like when we were working <laughs> corporate jobs. I mean, I mean, we've talked about so much like on the podcast and with one another, like we should have gone to South America a year before we went to South America. Because like yeah, there was I mean, both point. of us were being honest with ourselves like we weren't happy in the situation we were in but it's like okay let's like work for another year it looks better on a resume you know we can sign a lease for a year we're getting a good price life's not that bad like all these like things seemed like good yeah for me like i i found myself trying to make sure i was 100 percent prepared before taking that step as if like perfection if i could just attain a certain level of comfort or security or physical fitness or whatever then I would be ready to do it. But the truth is sometimes you just have to take a step and like make things like things work out as you go. A lot of the ways, like I found my online job because I went on the bike ride. I would have never found that job if I just stayed at my corporate gig, gig in Los Angeles. But because I was willing to step out, go on an adventure, meet people, build my network, opportunities presented themselves, which allowed us to continue the bike ride for even longer. And now that's the job I have now. And I just work full time now. 
Yeah, I think that's that, that's a really important thing. Like when we quit, we got to this point where we we're like, forget it. We don't know what we're gonna do um, afterwards or where we're gonna go. But I don't we just even need think to, we were even. We thinking just need about to quit. That, yeah, we, we hadn't just hadn't even out. considered it. Um, but then once you go out and you start doing something new, people come find you because yeah. you're doing something cool or. You, and you find something new about yourself, and then you're like, oh, I want to pursue this direction. Um, but, but I think that's something that held us back, too, where you're like, we need to make sure that I can think about where I'm going to go when I come back six months from now. Um, yeah. Am I going to set myself up for a job? I need to create a plan. Um, but mm-hmm. you, sometimes you just need to say, like, forget it. I'm just going to go wing it and see what happens. When I arrived in L.A., like, the last like two or three weeks before I finished that first bike ride, I spent a lot of time worrying about what I was going to do in LA. It's like, I don't have a place to live. I don't have a job. I have none of these things, but no amount of preparation I was trying to do actually was fruitful. Like it wasn't until I got on the ground and just kind of like networked out a little bit that everything fell into place. Yeah. Yeah. That's sort of the same as us. It's like, it's like, let's like make sure that these jobs aren't the jobs that we want to work for the rest of our lives. Yeah. Like, you know, it's been a year and I feel pretty certain I don't want to continue doing this, but let's like do it a little bit longer just yeah. like, to be a hundred percent sure. Let's, let's like do it for another year and save a little bit more money, mm-hmm. even though it's like, you know, you're spending money on such silly, ridiculous things <laughs> because you're not happy. <laughs> yeah. As I say, you're not happy. So you're willing, you're like, Oh, I, I've earned this. $12 cocktail at a bar or I've earned this fancy meal or I've earned like whatever, because you're so miserable, you're trying to like find some joy in your life and it ends up like preventing you from preparing from not being miserable to like branching out. Yeah. Are you smiling? Yeah. We just chocolate, chocolate covered, covered ginger. Yeah. I, I love chocolate covered ginger. Um, <laughs> and that's like my thing. <laughs> Ryan's like, like not bad day, come home. Best day at ginger. work if he's got chocolate covered ginger. Um, <laughs> it's Friday chocolate covered ginger. <laughs> so one of the things that I love about traveling is coming home after and like you rediscover your clothes. It's kind of like Christmas. You're like, oh, wow, I've got like a second <laughs> pair of shoes or like I've got a pair yeah. of jeans here. I forgot about this. Um, what were some of those things when you first kind of settled back in that you really appreciated that you think most people who haven't done an adventure like that would appreciate a bathtub. Yeah. Oh, being yeah. able to take a hot bath in a bathtub that is your own. That isn't like someone you're couch surfing with. That isn't like a sketchy motel. That isn't like to be able to like put music on. And that's another thing, be able to play music loud. It's like weird stuff like that. Like, Oh, when I'm home, if I want to just hang out and listen to music, I'm not concerned about disturbing anybody. I have all the electricity I need because when we were traveling, we had a solar panel, but it's not like we could be watching Netflix for very long off of solar power. Um, you know, it was little stuff like that. Like I didn't have, I like literally got rid of 99% of my possessions. So when we like settled into Wilmington, we had nothing. Like we just got a couch two weeks ago and we've been here six months and we just didn't have <laughs> a couch like, cause we just had nothing. Um, and we've been slowly accumulating things, but I don't know, little stuff like that to be able to go into the fridge and the beers are cold because they haven't been sitting in the back of a bike trailer for the last 12 hours in the sun. Uh, like, yeah, so it's just like, in like Louisiana, the beers aren't staying very chilled. No, no, they were. And <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. It's like just like little luxury items like that. Like just, I don't know, for me, it's a bit, I love baths. Like, so to be able to just like get into a hot bath whenever I want it has been. I adore baths as well, so I, like, totally get it. When people are like, don't you find it gross? Like, do you rinse off after? I'm like, what is gross about bathing? It's, like, the greatest oh. pr- privilege in the world. <laughs> and and stayed, I love... I was going to say, we stayed at a villa um, last week, and it was, like, this beautiful, beautiful villa that we were treated mm-hmm. to, and it had this massive big stone bath, and I spent, like, three hours in it. I was like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> bathing and reading harry potter i've got bubbles like this is the life <laughs> on my uh on my first bike ride there's a town called pie town new mexico where this lady has a house that's called the toaster house and okay. she basically raised her five kids in it and then when her kids all grew she decided she wanted to travel the world so she just leaves the house open to anyone that's coming through that may need a place to stay so it's filled with decades of just like journal entries from strangers that have just stayed at her house because she's never there so it's just this big house but like i stopped there and they had this she had like a giant like claw bathtub with like bubbles and stuff and it was just 
I was like, this is the greatest experience of my life. Like I'm in this stranger's house. Nobody's here, but the fridge is stocked. There's a welcome mat and I'm just yeah, enjoying so, life. A bit. So how does that work logistically? Does everyone who comes in just like leave some stuff and cleans up? Yeah. Like themselves? that was, yeah, there was just like baskets filled with everything from like clean socks to bike tubes to shampoo. And it was just like signs that say, take what you can, leave what you can. So, you know, I was traveling with someone else at the time. So there was a couple of beers in the fridge. There was a blueberry pie in the fridge. And yeah, and people just left whatever mementos they want. And it was just filled with like drawings and posters and photos. And it's wow. just like a cool little little haven. It reminded me of Burning Man a lot. It's just like this little burner community sitting there in the middle of New Mexico. That's really yeah. cool. So I'm wondering, what were some of the places, the cities and towns that you got to go to while biking that most people never hear about or visit that really stood out? Um, I found that like we really liked me in particular, really liked kind of cities that were about like a hundred thousand people and like kind of college towns were kind of quirky. Uh, like Santa Fe, New Mexico. I loved Missoula, Montana, where we lived was a, a blast. Um, and then it was, then there'd be like little stuff. Like we ended up at, um, in Lake Superior area. Like we actually had one of our trailers break while we were, up there, so we ended up in this tiny town right on the lake for like three or four days that you wouldn't even find on a map if you didn't like all these places that people would just drive through or they would take a highway to go around. Like we actually got to stop and couch surf with locals and kind of experience it a little bit. Yeah, I found that so. It's one of the things about like a road trip. Road trip has a lot of like romance around it. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're actually doing it, it's tough because sometimes like you're trying to go, oh, we've got an Airbnb booked in yeah. me Memphis, for example. And you're like, do we really want to go 45 minutes off the road to this town? <laughs> like we're on the interstate. We've got like a good podcast going on. And you just end up like kind of sticking to the route more yeah. so than if you're on a bike and you have to go to all these random spots because you're not actually traveling that far. And you want to get off the highway because it's kind of sketchy being on there in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, we, I mean, we encountered all kinds of, I think it was in North Dakota. There was an entire like back highway. It was like 10 or 15 miles long. They just had works of local art, just like on the side of the highway. And it was wow. way off the interstate. And if we weren't avoiding the interstate, we would have never discovered it. But it's just like random art that we would sit in. And like some of it was like sculptures and we took photos with it. And it's like, this is super cool. Like we had no idea this existed. I can't find this on Google. And it ended up being some of the best photos and some of the best memories we had. It was just stumbling upon these artworks. Yeah, that's really cool. I love that. I mean, I mean, yeah, like, you get that like a little bit with road trips, I guess, like more than you do if you like fly, say, from point A to point B for sure. Yeah. But I think it's tough. Like when you're in a car, I remember we were in New Mexico. Um, maybe actually, no, we were just outside of Amarillo, Texas. Um, mm -hmm. And there's this spot where these like there's these cars oh, that are like yeah. stuck into the oh the like Cadillacs or something yeah that are all, like in the... and we we're just like you know we're ripping by we're like going seventy miles an hour and we're like what the, what is that should we stop I don't and know we I'm have like, to get off the interstate it. I've seen like, and then all so we these don't photos. stop and then like later on we're like oh you really should have stopped there whereas on, if you're on a bike you're, you know you're just kind of like putting on by and you're like should we stop yeah you're why not putting on by <laughs> <laughs> unless you're like Lance like, Armstrong but. <laughs> It actually reminded me, like, I don't know why I didn't think about this. You're like biking through the redwoods in Northern California was one of the most amazing experiences ever because like you are like immersed in the smells and the feeling of the air, like in a way that you can't in a car. And like you said, it's like, oh, there's a giant redwood on the side of the road. There's nowhere to park, but we can pull our bikes off the side of the road and go take pictures and climb on it and have like a picnic. And I know it was like you talked about like having an Airbnb and like having this set schedule. Those were actually some of our worst. Day. Like we met great people through couch surfing, but when we had this schedule that we had to get to a certain place at a certain time, that's when we missed out on a lot of the serendipity. It's when we missed out on a lot of the random experiences because we were rushing to get somewhere and we couldn't take time to go to that little cafe or look at that lake or hang out by the river. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Especially to like, it probably puts pressure on you to like, you know, get to this point and you have to bike so far to get there. Yeah. Um, I feel like a lot of times like physical activities are like actually mental games. I'm sure there's a lot of mental games oh, yeah. when you're biking <laughs> long term. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, everything from you get stuck in your head. Like if you're going to spend like where we bike together, my wife and I, but we can't hold a conversation when you're on a highway on bicycles. So you get stuck in your head a lot and you, 
like you can do things like listen to podcasts and listen to audiobooks and music and stuff, but yeah, it becomes a very difficult mental exercise, especially when you're like going up a mountain or we were facing um, 30 or 40 mile per hour headwinds at one point where we're oh. pedaling as fast as we can and we're going two to three miles per hour. Like just nice. it screws with your mind because you're just like looking around and you're like, there's no escape. I don't know how to handle this. Yeah. And, like you're, yeah. I know some of those hills too, like, you, you'll drive a road, for example, and there's like maybe mm-hmm. a hill that's like two miles long or something like that. And it's just like a slight grade and you're in a car. So you're like, oh, whatever. This isn't an issue. But then when you're on a bike, you're like, is this hill ever going to end? It's, it's, the, yeah, it's the worst biggest thing ever. I don't think people realize how hilly the country is and how much of the country is just slight rolling hills. Yeah. Because we'll ask people like, oh, no, it's flat all the way there. And then we're just doing <laughs> up a mile, down a mile, up a mile, down a mile for all day. It's like, yeah. no, nothing in this country is flat. And people have no perspective on distance. They're like, two or three miles from here is this town. And it'll be like 19 miles. But that's not what you said. Yeah. <laughs> when um, my friend and I went to Glacier National Park a couple summers ago, and mm-hmm. we met two guys who were biking. One of them had actually biked from like the southern tip of South America. And we actually met up with him and Bamp had him on the podcast, which was super cool. But oh, that's incredible. I, yeah. I hadn't realized how like, like Glacier National Park is very, very hilly. So we're oh, like yeah. driving the car. She rolls down the window. She's like, hi, Alex. <laughs> like, out the window. <laughs> and he's just like huffing it up this hill in his bike. And I was like, damn, that is, yeah, w- that's a lot of work. Yeah, we went to Glacier, but we took the bus up to the top. But yeah, we saw people like <laughs> cycling up the top, and it's like, no, that's <laughs> that looks terrible. <laughs> Don't do that. It did look terrible. <laughs> yeah. It's it's really interesting to me that there's this whole like when we interviewed Alex, who had gone from Patagonia to Canada, um, he was kind of just like filling us in, and there's this whole like subculture of people who are on these long distance bike rides, mm-hmm. um, and like connections and resources where you can like stay and these like huts set up. Um, yep. Did you guys meet a lot of other people who were, I mean, it can't mean a lot, but like other yeah. people who were doing similar things while you were out there? Uh, it depends on where we were when we were on the Southern tier cycling route through like Florida and stuff. We met a lot of other cyclists, but we actually ended up following a guy on Instagram who was on a bike tour and then connected with him that way. And then we ended up camping at the same place to each, as each other. Like, so we like met people through random social networks. Um, do you know, are you familiar with warmshowers.com? Yeah. I think you yeah. mentioned that to us. Yeah. It's, it's like couch surfing, but for cyclists. And we use that all the time. And we've had, a, we've been able to host people since we've been in Wilmington. And we had a guy come down and stay with us. And then a girl came down a week later and they ended up meeting up and like doing Florida together, the two of them that they met through us. So, yeah, it is this like little subculture of people. We all try to help each other out and connect with each other. Yeah, it's it's an interesting group that I didn't know existed when I went on my first bike ride. I thought I was being super original by biking across the country (laughs) in 2012. And then I found out that thousands and thousands of people do it all the time. Yeah, it's always funny too when you get into a subculture like that and you find out like there's all those like judgy stuff about it. Like I know we moved to Kenmore, which is like a mountain town, but we're not, well, at least I'm not like particularly like, I'm going to go trek everywhere, hike all these mountains. <laughs> but like within that group, that subset of people who are all about hiking and climbing, like there's all this like, you know, I'll judge this person because they you know, all they care about is summiting mountains to say they've done it. Yeah. There's all these like reasons to tear people down. Oh, it's I, I remember that when I went on, on my first ride because I looked nothing like a bike tourist. Like I was like just in ratty clothing. I had a bike that I bought at Target for a hundred dollars. Like <laughs> and so I would meet cyclists who had, you know, ten thousand dollars worth of equipment and they're like, You're not gonna make it across the country. Like there was this hostility towards people coming into their culture that didn't fit a specific ter- stereotype. But I started to realize that that's like ten percent of the population. Everyone else is awesome, but you see that with political parties and yeah. every movement, every hobby, there's the very vocal 10% who are just kind of terrible people, but everyone else is kind of really cool and supportive. And like, I've noticed that with martial arts and with yoga and everything like that, you have very vocal people who you wish would stop being so vocal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm pretty like big into like yoga communities and you still mm-hmm. get that with like it within a practice that's completely yeah. dedicated towards like or should be dedicated towards like unity and not having comparison. They're still like in teacher communities or it's like, Oh, you can't do that. Mm, you actually teach. Mm. 
Okay. <laughs> so, I'm like, I feel I, like I want nothing to do with that. <laughs> I feel like it's sad, but like more often than not, I'll leave a yoga practice. And one of the first things I'll overhear is someone talking shit about someone else <laughs> that was in the practice because they couldn't do something or they're not trying or they're, it's like, you are missing everything. Every or point like of this judging what they're wearing. <laughs> yeah. It's like, focus on yourself. Who cares what they're wearing? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's always going to be those people. And I think it kind of yeah. loops around to what we were talking about a little bit earlier, like this unsatisfaction with life. It's mm -hmm. like if you're unsatisfied with what you're doing, then you turn externally to tear other people down yeah. because you're unhappy. Yeah. And people become very territorial of their hobbies and their because their adventures or whatever is important to them. And they there's this like mentality of like now that I'm here, no one else should come in. I remember I noticed that like you'll move to a city and someone will be like, I moved here seven years ago and I just wish people didn't live here, keep moving here. It's like you moved here. Like what, <laughs> who are you to tell people that showed up one week after you that they shouldn't live here anymore because right. you don't like that it's becoming crowded. Yeah. It's, it's so easy to attach your identity to things. Uh, the city's a little bit different, but activities I yeah. find it's just like, you know, figuring out who you are is kind of challenging and it's easy yeah. to get lost in activities. And then when someone comes in, you're like, that's my thing. That's who I am. Yeah. You can't be me. It's threatening. Yeah. Um, I think that's something that, I mean, I struggle with, but I'm definitely aware of it, that it becomes very easy to attach yourself to it. Like identify with actions and hobbies and roles. Like I see that with like people like identify as a mother, as a teacher, as whatever, and then if that's stripped away from them, it becomes like a psychotic break. Like it's something that they protect at all costs. And I'm just as guilty of that when I got out of the military, I was very much like, I'm an army guy. And it took a lot of, you know, a lot of meditation, a lot of self-reflection, a lot of analysis to break past that and yeah. realize that we are more than just what we identify with. We just did an interview um, a couple of weeks ago with somebody who's big in the travel industry and he's he's been traveling for 10 years and he just made the decision to kind of have a home base in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And we were talking a little bit about how, you know, same thing as you, like when you, you make the decision to stop with something, it's attached to your identity. So it's like he's mm -hmm. attached an identity, built up a following around like I travel continuously, like yeah. I've been traveling for X amount of years. And it's something we've talked about too, it's like you know, can we just like stop traveling and yeah. go back to like a regular life? Or is it like <laughs> weird, you know, like we run a podcast on traveling, we promote these ideas, these philosophies, <laughs> like how do you turn around and like change it because of something you want? So it's just kind of an interesting thing to think about. Yeah. I was going to say what happens to the world wanderers when you're not wandering anymore. Like, yeah. right. <laughs> That's what, so when we, went, we moved down to Atlanta when I was doing Praxis um, and working at Fee. Like we spent nine months in Atlanta, yeah. <laughs> um, which, you know, that's not really traveling, but we're just like, yeah, yeah. The, th the beautiful thing about podcasting is there's like no rules and it's easy to trick yeah. yourself into thinking that you're like somehow bound by the rules that formerly applied to like radio programs where it's like, oh, yeah. these producers this need to be topic focused when the reality is we just made up a name and like we can do whatever <laughs> we want. If we wanted to turn this into like, I don't know, <laughs> cooking show. We can yeah. do it. I mean, that might be. Yeah. Everyone to stop weird. listening, probably. <laughs> <laughs> You'd attract a different group of people. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no rules, though. I think that that applies like on a bigger scale, like to life, like thinking about how you know, not just people who have like a podcast or a blog or a website, like anything you're doing. If you decide to shift it at some point, like just like mm -hmm. you were talking about, Peter, like you were cycling across the country, you told people you were doing that. Cyclist becomes an identity. At yeah. any point, you're allowed to shift that and change that. It is really hard. And in some ways, like I think I occasionally overcompensate and switch gears more quickly than I definitely should. <laughs> like instead of like mastering something or exploring something completely, I'll say, man, I feel like I've been stuck in this rut. I've been into beer brewing for too long. Let's look into oil painting or something completely different because I don't want to get stuck in that rut. And it can be it can become real easy to not explore something to the fullest because you're afraid of over identifying with it. There's a there's definitely a balance to be struck. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Actually, I hadn't really thought about that. Yeah, where do you think the balance is between pushing into that? Because you there's kind of like a, a zone where it's like something's novel yeah. and new, it's exciting, it's energizing, and then you hit a kind of like a rut where it's like this is the valley of like work or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, how do you find a balance? Um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think it depends a lot on the specifics, like. For me, like like writing and blogging, 
I still very I, I identify with that, but I also have no urge to change it. Like I still get a lot of pleasure and joy out of it, even if what I'm writing isn't being read. Like it's just a practice that I enjoy. Uh, like stuff like yoga is the same way. Like I don't I don't really identify as yoga, but it's something that I don't feel any urge to change. But then there'll be stuff like I looked into like woodworking for a while and I did it for like five minutes and I was like, all right, I'm already over this. Like this is not something that I, I feel like I'm getting value out of. Or like a better example is learning a foreign language. I've tried so many times to learn a foreign language and I always quit. And even though logically I know that there's a ton of value in it, I just can't seem to get the joy out of it that I need to push myself to keep me moving. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, didn't really answer your question, but I really have no idea where the balance is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just something that I guess like everyone's figuring out for themselves as you go. Yeah. Uh, and I do feel like it's easy to convince. I feel like there's so many more people are on the side of the spectrum where it's like, we tell ourselves we should do this. You know, I need to learn this language to fluency. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it's probably good to f- swing back on the spectrum to just like trust, <laughs> trust your instinct. Like if you're yeah. finding yourself not doing something, you know, and you're just beating yourself up every day. Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing this? It's often good to just like give it up and just say, Oh, I trust my instincts. I'm going to find the thing that really makes me come alive eventually. It's, I don't know. It's, it's hard to find that balance. Sometimes it's like, is this difficult or do I hate this? Like, is this just a rough patch? Is this just something that's taking me a while to learn, but like I should continue pushing on or is this something that is making me miserable and uncomfortable and I dread sitting there and trying to conjugate verbs and stuff all day. So maybe I should stop. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's something that we've talked a lot about and like talked with other people on the podcast about too. It's, it's, it's kind of like, it's very like slippery slope there. It's like Mm -hmm. figuring out, you know, is this just something that's challenging me and making me feel like uncomfortable because I'm outside of my comfort zone? Or is it something that like I legitimately like don't want to be doing? And I, I think just being aware of that, is 95% of the battle. Like one of my favorite like stoic practices is to like at the end of the day, just spend a few minutes and like evaluate my day. And if I look and go, man, this is the third day in a row that I didn't go running. Why is that? Am I just being lazy or is this something, or do I need to find a new way to get cardiovascular exercise? Cause I hate this, but just like that practice of like sitting down and analyzing and just being aware that it could fall on either end of the spectrum. I feel like you kind of figure it out naturally just by looking into it. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about how there's a lot of good serendipitous moments that come when you're biking across the country. What are some on the the other <laughs> end of the spectrum? Maybe not even but the bad ones, just like the crazy ones. What are some of the moments uh, that jump to mind? Um, people are terrible drivers comes to mind. <laughs> like literally Anna and I were biking in a bike lane, like we had a bike lane. And I looked behind me and noticed that someone was trying to use the bike lane to pass someone on the right. And so flew into the lane and I had to like take my entire bike off the shoulder into the dirt and stuff because he was just flying down the road. Um, We got caught in basically flash flooding in eastern Texas and got stranded in the tiny town of Orange, Texas, right on the Louisiana border because we had no other option. That's just where we were at the time. So we had to get a cheap motel and just sit out the rainstorm. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. Like when you're on a bike, you really can be the victim of a lot of circumstance. Like you have no control over the weather. You don't have windows you can roll up. You don't have a heater. If things get bad, we uh we stayed at a campground in I think this was Louisiana, and we just got drenched, torrential downpour. And that's when we found out that there was a hole in our tent. So everything <laughs> on the inside of our tent completely soaked. And our only like relief was it's okay. We're in a campground. They have a laundromat here in the campground. So we like get everything together, put it in the washer, go to move everything to the dryer and learn that all the dryers are broken. Uh, So now everything we own just got out of the washer (laughs) and it's it's like 35 degrees outside. And we ended up sleeping inside the laundry room because uh, everything. Yeah. So it's like situations like that where you wake up and you're like, that was terrible. Like that's (laughs) this sucks. Sometimes it just really, really sucks. We uh, we camped behind a church. Because we had like – it was the day we actually had really bad headwinds, and we're like, we need to stop somewhere. So we found this abandoned church, set up behind the abandoned church, and all night long, this dog kept coming by and barking at us all night, every hour, just getting real close to the tent, bark, 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 bark. 
morning finally came and we realized the church isn't abandoned. It's just broken. It's just like really messed up. And it's also Easter morning. So now there's all kinds of people like walking around our tent because we thought we were behind an abandoned building. And none oh of them gosh. spoke and none of them spoke English. It was like a Hispanic Catholic church and we couldn't explain <laughs> anything that was happening. <laughs> and they probably thought you were homeless. Yeah, like and they and we would we would encounter that. It was really interesting. You discover that the way people treat you if they think you're homeless is very different than if they think you're like a trust fund baby on it. Those were the two options. Everyone thought we were homeless or we were a trust fund baby, depending on like their perception. And like neither one was true. But we would go through cities where people wouldn't give us the time of day, but then homeless people would give us food and money and support 100%. It's like you'd have the wealthy people who wouldn't even, who'd turn their nose up at you. And the poorer people were, the more likely they were to look after us what do you and like provide behind, us. What do you think is behind that? Um, I think it's a combination of things. I think it's people who tend to be down on the luck or homeless or living on the streets know how bad things can get. So they want to help prevent that in other people. But I also think they tend to value, they understand how important it is to look out for each other like and value human connection. Whereas if you make a lot of money and you're completely divorced from ever interacting with people who serve you food or people that are of a different socioeconomic class, I think there's also the fear that if people are poor, they're probably criminals, which I've noticed has not been our experience, at least not when we're like actually out on the road. We've had no experiences where people tried to rob us or do anything like that people always thought we were going to get robbed or killed like that was something that's like oh it's so dangerous it's like yeah this is the safest time in human history if you don't have and that guess ABS what security system you're definitely gonna yeah. die <laughs> but 99.99 percent of the people in this world are good people and have no desire to hurt anybody else and that other 0.001 percent <laughs> there's nothing you could do to stop them even if they did want to hurt you so right now i think right. i I don't know. In today's 24 hour news cycle, you hear about all the terrible things that are happening all the time. And that's just not what's actually happening out there. Yeah, we found that's such a huge part about traveling to other countries is just when you're at home, your perceptions of all these other places comes from the news. Mm -hmm. And obviously, that's heavily biased to the, the negative events. And then you just yeah. go out there and you find like, oh, hey, I can get good Wi-Fi. Uh, <laughs> there's like Starbucks basically everywhere. Uh, yeah. It's just like another place. Like A lot of these places, if you were dropped into a major city, like if you dropped into a lot of locations in like Bangkok, for example, you might not even be able to tell that you weren't in America. Yeah, um, you'd be like, oh, there's a lot of uh, like Thai people here, but <laughs> 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 some Starbucks, it's KFC, this yeah. Burger King. No, we were actually in a in a cafe slash restaurant the other day in Seminyak, which is super touristy in Bali. And I was like, if I got to drive down here, I would have no idea if I was in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, oh, yeah. the U.S., the U.K. Like it was, it was just full of like white people, essentially, yeah. like. And, you know, you'd probably have to, like, listen to accents a little bit. And there was no <laughs> sign of, like, where you could have been because of the, the way that this place looked and the food they were serving, which is, like, pretty incredible. Yeah, people are – like, I don't know if it's a generational thing. Like, I know, like, my parents, like, terrified of the idea of travel. And, like, they just, like, love their suburban area in Oregon and have, like, little intention of, like, doing much beyond that. Whereas, like, me and all my siblings are like, all right, let's go. Let's – See the world. Let's go do things. Yeah, really interesting generational divide. Um, I, I think they're, yeah, I think it's the internet, to be completely honest. I think yeah. our ability to connect and have access to information from all over the world. Like, I have friends in countries on every continent at this point, and that's just something that it would be, you know, physically or just be impossible for my parents to have that. Yeah, and I think that one thing that's really fascinating for me is, um, in previous generations, like Generation X, for example, you'd say that like, or generate I don't know what it came before, like baby boomers, whatever. <laughs> like that's like a, a Western generation, like Canada, mm -hmm. US, Australia, maybe Europe, you can count that too. But then this like younger generation, the people who grew up entirely on the internet, um, that's a completely global generation, like the first one yep. ever. So we were in Myanmar, for example, and that's an interesting example because they've been, um, had to crazy socialist dictatorship government that's only recently kind of liberalized so yeah. this young generation is the first generation to not be forced into that culture and you go around and you see kids wearing hoodies with knockoff <laughs> beats by dre headphones you see kids who look like bieber you see these yeah. girls who are dressed traditionally but on youtube 
Uh, and so even the poorest, most isolated countries in the world, that younger generation is still connected and still shares a common culture around yeah. the world. It's really fascinating. Yeah, when I was in college, I actually went to Cameroon, Africa, to help uh, set up some computer labs at some of the colleges down there. Like we brought a bunch of computers with us and stuff. And it was the first we went to this like tribal, basically village that had almost no contact with the outside world. And then we gave them computers. And in the eight years since, I'm still connected with some of them. And just the change, like almost it feels like overnight. Because you showed up and it was just very traditional. And now, like, you're talking to people who are better at computer programming than I am. And, like, yeah. we have a better handle of technology than I do. And they all have cell phones over there. And it was, yeah, it's, we're, in, it's going to keep changing too. It's like very, I don't know. I find it super exciting to have, like, all these different minds and brains and creative personalities able to connect across the globe. We have entire continents that have been in the dark until recently. And it's, it's about to change. Yeah, and able to work too. Like you can yeah. have hired some people on Upwork. One was in Ukraine, one was in India. Um, but no matter where you are now, you have access. If you've got the skills, you can get the work. Yeah. So. Yeah, that capital infusion in these countries is going to be huge. It's, it's going to be great. So yeah. two more questions um, from my yeah. end. Uh, I guess I'll go. F First of all, I think something that's really interesting is um, finding some way to create something around your adventure or the trip you've mm -hmm. taken you, so you wrote a book um yep. about about riding across the country for two years uh aside from like you know putting the book out there selling the book just going through that creative process what what was that like what were the what did you gain from doing that and would you recommend trying to write or podcast <laughs> or create something around an adventure to anyone who's doing something like traveling or I think, I mean, I think everybody should try to create something around it because I, I found the entire experience valuable. Like I've always like enjoyed writing, but I'd never gone through the very structured process. And I don't know, this isn't going to be a huge surprise, but school didn't prepare me very well for actually sitting down and structure and writing a book. Um, and I went about it like, to hear that. I know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't get grade seven, how to write and self publish. Yeah, no, I didn't. And I actually did like, all the self-publishing stuff myself, like Isaac Morehouse, he actually is like, Hey, you know, I would recommend paying someone to do the copy editing, stuff like that. And I mean, it shows that I self-published, but I really enjoyed the experience. Just understanding how things work from the inside, like understanding how that process works. It was a great learning experience for me, but I don't know, like we're, we have a couple more book ideas. Like Anna and I, she's a, she's a pretty talented artist. And we're talking about putting some children's books together about our other bike ride and like base it around like the adventures of our dog as he travels around the country by bike and like oh, cool. visits these random little places like oh here's a beach where all the there's no sand on the beach it's all just like these little marbles because people used to throw broken glass into the ocean and it just like wore away to these soft like marbles that are all over the beach and so like these little quirky places that we encountered we thought it'd be cool to do like you know some children's book picture books of our dog exploring all these places that's really cool. So, I love that idea. Yeah, and I've I've been playing with the idea of doing a podcast for a while, but I think after our conversation now today, I probably will do it because I was always trying to find like the thing I wanted, the subject, the unique point of view, and I'm like, maybe I'll just sit here and talk for ten minutes at a time and see what happens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I had a radio show in college, and I absolutely loved it. I would just sit there and talk for two hours, play music. And yeah, it's one of those things like when you, once you start. Um, from from our perspective, it seems like we have all this whole range of interests. But then from mm -hmm. the outside perspective, people, you, you're really not as different. Your interests yeah. really aren't as separate as they seem. So then once you start, you're like, oh, I'm actually tend to focus on this one thing. And yeah. that's really yeah. what I do. Um, awesome. And then biking is, like, I think a lot of people have this romantic idea. I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to go <laughs> to Bali or um, yeah. backpack Asia. You know, biking around America isn't... I mean, it's romantic in a lot of ways, but it's not as exotic. Um, yeah. Maybe you don't have the answer to this, but well, <laughs> why should pe why should people consider bike touring as opposed to heading to Europe to backpack or um, yeah. something like that? Well, I, I think f there's a lot of practical logistics of staying. I guess this is for the American audience is to staying like domestic is that you do have easier access to family and stuff like 
my wife and I, we both have elderly grandparents who probably only have a few good years left, and we don't want to be halfway across the globe if there's a health issue. So just be able to do that. And you can also pace yourself. There's all kinds of um, like cross state rides. Like there's one in Iowa called Ragbri. It's like a week where you just travel with thousands of other people by bike across the state. And that you'll find like little like four or five day week long month line tours that kind of help you baby step into adventuring that maybe not probably isn't as intimidating as backpacking through South America or something like that. Um, and then there's also Adventure Cycling is a major organization based out of Montana, but they have like entire maps and route guides and support systems in place for people that want to get out and kind of travel by bicycle. Awesome. That's really cool. Yeah, it's something we actually had when we announced that we were going to Asia. We had a listener of the podcast asked us why we were not just adventuring through Canada and <laughs> it kind of made me think about the answer to that because I think there's like a couple different parts to it. It's like saying that I'm adventuring through Canada feels like much less exciting yeah. to me than going to Asia. And even like going to the U S was like, I'm going to go like live, live, not live in the U S but like, you know, spend longer term period of time down there, get to know like yeah. a different culture. Um, cause the yeah. Southern U S is quite different from Canadian culture. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think that adventuring in your own backyard has a lot to offer because you get to know these like different parts of your country, especially a country as big as the U S or as Canada, you can get to know like all these different places. North America is a giant backyard. Like there's, there's so many subcultures and almost different countries. It feels like as you cross the continent that I think people do overlook it. Like they say like, yeah, I want to go do something in Europe or Asia. It's like, and for a fraction of the price, you could go to hike in some of the most beautiful canyons in the world in Utah. You could go swim in all five of the Great Lakes. You could go, you know, raft down rivers that go through multiple states for days and days and days. Like there's adventures to be had here if people want to have them. Like I just I don't think people should count it out. Like I'm looking forward to international travel. I really am. But there's a lot of cool stuff to do here, too. Like you can have some amazing adventures and meet some incredible people. And guess what? Everyone who from other countries comes to America because we're the foreigners. And so we've had a German girl stay with us. We've had a Swedish couple stay. Like we have people from all over the world will come to America. So you can meet people from other cultures here too. The funny things I was going to say, like when you go to Europe, for example, and you're going to stay at hostels and backpack around, you meet a lot of Australians, um, a lot of Americans, Mm -hmm. a lot of Canadians, uh, but like, you know, if you go out bike around Canada, for example, Western Canada, you're probably going to meet a lot of Germans, um, yeah. a lot of European people, a uh, lot of Eastern Canadians, you probably meet more European people in Canada than you, if you go out biking or trekking, <laughs> than you would if you actually yeah. went to Europe and just did the hostel thing. Yeah, it's, it's funny. The, the German girl that stayed with us, we were talking to her. She's like, yeah, I've been looking forward to this. And we were talking about, it's like, man, I'd love to come to Germany. She's like, yeah, it's not really that exciting and i was like yeah but it is to me like i've never been there yeah it's, it's always like, perspective right it's yeah. like i don't somewhere that's not like your home your home place seems so yeah. much so much more like exotic and fun and interesting and exciting because it's new and there's that there's that thrill for me able to like check off the box be like i've been to this many countries i've been to this many new places i've that you just don't get as much you're like oh i've been to kansas whoop do you do there's nothing in yeah. kansas but if you're like, I've been to Thailand, that sounds way more exciting and just having that passport stamp and everything. Uh, yeah. Kansas is actually the only like Western central state that I haven't been to. <laughs> you, you really are not missing anything. <laughs> but I want to say that I've been to all 50 states. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like when you look on a map, it's like North Dakota, Kansas, and then just like yeah. the Eastern ones, yeah. the, the uh, Northeastern ones. It's a nice. Kansas. I really should have done Kansas while I was in the <laughs> South. <laughs> There's no reason for me to go now. Yeah. <laughs> no. It's not that bad. I like, I like ragging on Kansas, but there's just not a lot there. It's just, yeah, it's just open land on the way to Colorado for the most part. Yeah. Um, so one last question. Just on a practical side of things, what have you learned from doing, uh, you know, months and months and months of bike uh, touring that you would apply next time you go out? Like what are some practical tips that you wouldn't have thought of before, but next time you go out biking, you're definitely going to apply. Um, well, this was something we applied once we got to Montana and took our first long break 
it's worth it to invest in a high quality equipment if you're going to be doing extreme like sporting and like like we had really cheap bicycles when we started and then we were breaking down so often because they weren't built for what we were doing that we ended up like investing in really good bikes and it was a financial commitment but if you're going to be spending a lot of time adventuring or doing something high quality equipment is usually worth it but on the flip side never let money prevent you from going on an adventure like if you only have twenty dollars to your name get on your bicycle that you've had since you were 10 and go see how far twenty dollars will get you like i would like i think people i think people overestimate how many barriers there are to doing amazing things sometimes the biggest barrier is mental and you just take a step out and do it um and then another thing i wish i think in the future we're going to take more like do less planning and allow for more spontaneity like sometimes you see a beautiful lake and you just want to stop there and we didn't allow ourselves to do that as much as i would have preferred yeah yeah that's always a challenge when you're traveling for sure yeah you get very destination focused when yeah. that's not what it's about sometimes often totally yeah awesome. amazing well where can people go to find out more about you peter uh, you can check out my website. It's peterniger.com. Um, it's P-E-T-E-R-N-E-I-G-E-R.com. And my book's for sale on there. And I also blog fairly four or five times a week about. Amazing. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Oh, my pleasure. I had a great time, guys. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's been awesome chatting with you. To find more information, relevant links, and photos talked about in this week's episode, check out theworldwanders.com. If you have a question, comment, or feedback, send us an email at info at theworldwanders.com. Join our community on Facebook at The World Wanders or on Twitter at WorldWanders1. As always, thanks so much for listening. Have a great day. Bye.